hello, hello. Uh, thank you very much. I'll, uh, I'll do my best here. My understanding is that uh, this program is an hour. It started at 8, uh, which means it'll be over at 9, and you will get about 42 minutes of content. So I apologize to those who are here on time, including me. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, as, as we take a look at this, the, the most important thing first off is to take a look at the, uh, the, 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 the We'll start with sort of our, 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 our mission piece, if you will. Just so you know, I did not put this presentation together. This was put together by uh, Jones Lang LaSalle and Johnson Controls. And at the end of this, uh, flashed up on the screen, will be Jones Lang LaSalle and Johnson Controls uh, contact information. And more importantly, the, the individuals who were involved with the, the effort. So while you, you take a look at this, um, just understand where we were in, in uh, May of 2007. The C40 Cities uh, Climate Initiative is, is launched at the top of the, the, the Hearst Building, uh, which was one of the, you know, the, really the first major office buildings in the United States. I say major, meaning you know, 750, 800,000 square feet or, or bigger, to try to deploy <coughs> the nascent LEED standards. And uh, it, it really happened in a conversation there uh, with my, uh, my, my college roommate's youngest brother who happened to be working for the Clinton Climate Initiative. <clears throat> and the thought was to bring together the real estate community of the city of New York with the Clinton Climate Initiative to try to set up a, a, a you know, change, to effect change in how we consume energy. Um, I, I would say that there is a lot of uh, discussion about carbon. There's a lot of discussion about cli climate disruption. Um, this effort <coughs> measures carbon because it's a measurable thing. <coughs> but my effort is really all about, about, about energy. If we have an impact on carbon and if we have an impact on climate disruption, that's a good thing. Uh, but it's about energy and it's about money. Why? Because when I got started in this process, really before 2007, probably in February 2007, before May of 2007, I sat down for dinner with Carl Rove, which was difficult for me to do. But I wanted to chat with him because I wanted to find out if there's any common ground amongst people who are concerned about the future for the environment. Uh, and I don't mean the environment as a place where we go and visit, uh, but the environment as a place where we actually live, work, raise kids, go out to dinner, et cetera. And my turn. Uh, so what I found is I could have no discussion with him about climate disruption. I could have no discussion with him about carbon, but I could talk to him about money. Um, another step back, um, my wife and I found something at the Natural Resources Defense Council called the Center for Market Innovation. And the Center for Market Innovation is, is all about commercializing environmental practice. Uh, and it's about nothing against startups, but it's really about trying to impact markets. The fact of the matter is, that if you change Wall Street, you change the world. You change Walmart, you change the world. You change the business practices of major multinational corporations, you change the world. The best way to impact business is to show people a way to make money. And that's what this effort is all about. So most important of everything else is, is that what we have set out to do here is to create a replicable program using the Empire State Building. Why did we use the Empire State Building? I wanted to use 1333 Broadway. We have 8 million square feet in New York. We're spending over a billion and a quarter uh, fixing all those properties up. Uh, these were properties which had been managed by a firm called Helmsley Spear for a period of time, depending upon the property, four to, to five decades, four to six decades. And we moved to get rid of uh, Helmsley Spear as our managing agent. Uh, it, was a, it was a difficult process. Um, it was one that involved a long litigation. Uh, but when we were done, 
uh, we ended up with these buildings, which all needed a lot of upgrade. Uh, the Clinton Climate Initiative said if you're successful at 1333 Broadway, no one's going to care. Uh, so if you do the Empire State Building, however, everyone will notice. So the, 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 the bottom line is, here's our building. It's 102 stories, 2.8 million, 2.85 million rentable. Uh, we have 4 million visitors a year to the observatory. Uh, we have $11 million in annual energy costs. A component of that energy cost is in the, the, the broadcast operation. Uh, so that's not really going to be affected unless we get better, more efficient broadcast equipment. We have a peak electric demand, as noted. And uh, 88,000 uh, BTUs per square foot per year for the office building and a CO2 uh, emissions of 25,000 tons per, per, per year. Um, when we got started, as I said, one of the major issues that we were confronting is repositioning the Empire State Building. The Empire State Building is an international icon. Uh, can I have a show of hands of anybody who has been in the Empire State Building, please? Uh, can I have a show of hands as to anybody who has been to anything other than the observatory in the Empire State Building? Okay, so that faces our dilemma squarely. Um, who's been in the building since the lobby was redone? Okay, so this is, this is, this is the issue. Almost everybody knows in the world knows the Empire State Building. I, I could, if, if Richard Kessler's office were in the Empire State Building, I could write a postcard to Richard Kessler, Empire State Building, and mail it from a small town outside of Maasai Reserve in, in Kenya, so long as it has a stamp on it. And that would be the only address, and it would get to him. Okay? Period. You know, I've, I've had arguments with people in our, in our media campaigns where they said, get, get, the, get the frickin' address off of there. It's cluttering things up. You know, well, don't you want people to know where you are? And I'm looking at them like, you know, you're fired. You know, I mean, everybody in the world, you go to New York, you look up, you're there. That's how you find it. But uh, as an office building, uh, the place looked like a bus depot in Selma, Alabama in the 1950s. Uh, and the observatory experience, if you haven't been there in the last two and a half years, similarly, was an utter wreck. So for us, it was a matter of elevating the experience. It's also a matter of attracting tenants better tenants that we had. The average in place fully escalated rent per occupied square foot at the Empire State Building in August of 2006 when we took it over was $26.50. Okay, that's a few bucks above operating and real cost in real estate taxes. All right. It's now, by the way, a little over uh, three years later, about $37.25 and it's, it's moving on its way up. But the reality is that we had to reposition this asset. We also were looking at a simple challenge. Why did we do this work, which took place over the course of a little over 18 months, 16 months? An awful lot of that was putting the team together. An awful lot of that was convincing people to participate. An awful lot of that was lining things up. Why did we do it in secrecy? Uh, because we could have failed. What we could have done is proven that there really wasn't an economic argument to energy efficiency retrofits in existing buildings. Um, so again, we wanted to you know, use, use our work to, you know, to publicize and differentiate our building. We wanted a replicable model. And as I kept saying to people, if the only place we succeed is at the Empire State Building, we have failed. Why? Because between 40 and 50 percent of all energy consumed in the United States is consumed in the built environment. Approximately 70 to 75 percent of all energy consumed in New York City, the five boroughs, is in the built environment. You can build new energy efficiently, and that doesn't mean necessarily what is commonly referred to today as green, but energy efficiently. And all you're going to do is decrease the increase in energy consumption. You cannot tone down energy consumption without creating energy efficiency in the existing built environment. So as you notice, I made a comment about green versus energy efficiency. Part of my mission here 
is against what I believe has become the greenwashing of the world. All right? And, and, and I bought into that too. You walk into the Hearst building in May of 2007, you're confronted with a cascade of water, which is recycled gray water, which has been you know, provided it's rained enough, recycled gray water, which has been cleaned up enough to be used inside the building, which comes in off of the, when it rains into the, and, and, and it's collected on the roof. You've got all these things which are green. They've got all the points. Bank of America is a more recent example. But the reality is, there are really three columns that belong up here, only two which are, pertain to the Empire State Building. The, 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 the third column, which would be right here, is new green buildings. New green buildings, by common measurement, complying with LEED, by and large, are energy hogs. They are not energy savers. They are not energy efficient. Be it the Hearst Building or Bank of America, LEED motivates people to make decisions, to get points. Energy consumption is not a big factor in collecting points for LEED, new, new construction. It isn't. Energy consumption is not a big factor or a big enough factor for getting LEED points in LEED EB. You can comply with LEED and even get yourself up to platinum and still have one of the highest consumptions of electricity per square foot in any city. Right, that's the dirty secret about LEED. The dirty secret about LEED EB is you can get to LEED silver and you can even get to LEED gold without really impacting energy consumption because you can point your way around the equation. We're in discussions with USGBC. If you look at USGBC, come on in. USGBC version uh, uh, 2009 begins to address and increase the value component of energy consumption, but it still doesn't get to the simple point. There is no way in this world that you should be able to be LEED certified unless you materially reduce your energy consumption from the point that you started the certification process to the point that you complete it. So let's look at how we look at things. There are green practices that we can deploy in the Empire State Building. Renewable recycled content, indoor air quality, <coughs> green cleaning and pest control, recycling programs, energy conservation, in quotes, water reduction, integrated pest management, that's part of you know, the green cleaning. However, what's the difference about energy efficiency retrofits, okay? There is a big difference. We're going for reduced loads. We're going for reduced usage. We're going for optimized efficiency, consistent, constant commissioning. We're looking to provide controls, not just to the building, but to tenants. We're looking at intelligent investments built around life cycle cost analysis. We're looking at absolutely transparent quantitative results. Everything about green is qualitative. All right? And until green incorporates hard ass and analytical data rich deployment of technology to me, it doesn't cut it. Guaranteed savings. Johnson Controls has guaranteed our savings, not in dollars, though they will get to dollars, but in BTUs and watts. Regardless of what happens to the cost of energy, our savings are guaranteed by, in BTUs and watts. If we don't get them, we get paid. This is different from historical performance contract guarantees, where what actually happened was uh, they produced a, a document which enabled you to borrow from them to pay them for a lighting retrofit that they were going to do in your building. But the reality is 
They didn't really create the savings which were there, and all you did was buy on a layaway program relamping your building. You need a measurable payback and return on your investment. This is absolutely critical. So what we set up at the Empire State Building is a replicable, transparent, non-proprietary, which was my requirement, people can figure this out and do it, quantitative, performance guaranteed process for reducing energy consumption. All of the things bringing things together, recognition to develop more sustainable and efficient business practices. If we don't reduce the amount of energy that we use in our way of doing business today, we simply will have too much resource competition with other countries in the world which are growing their economies. That will create very big problems. It'll create inflationary problems. It'll also create conflict problems. We have energy supply constraints. So it's not just a matter of the fact that we're exporting money overseas. It's the fact that we have to project power overseas at a great cost in order to preserve our access to energy resources. Uh, there is no question that change is coming. <laughs> New York City's Greater Greener Building Code where I actually played a role with, in between the Real Estate Board of New York and the City of New York coming up with what version 1.0 is because the city was going off in a way that wasn't really going to work and the, the real estate industry just wanted to say no. So instead, we've actually got a pretty good code, which if you read it, however, you recognize the magnitude of the issue we confront. The change from version 1.0 of the building department's energy efficiency greater greener building code will not come for 15 to 20 years. Okay? So, by the way, we start from the perspective that the world as we know it, based on carbon output and energy consumption, will continue to get worse for another 10 to 20 years. All right? We're not screwing around here, folks. This is, this is really big stuff. Um, Corporations demand it, and customers, employees, and shareholders all want to know about energy efficiency. What are you doing to be better? The business opportunity. Appraisal industry is starting to look at energy efficiency as an asset or a liability. The SEC has said that they're going to start requiring companies to disclose their off-balance sheet currently liability from uh, about complying with, as they put it, carbon costs. But carbon, don't forget, is all about energy, all right? Marketability, operating costs, competitiveness, differentiating yourselves. One of the motivations that I had for doing the work at the Empire State Building, showing a healthier work environment Skanska, the Empire State Building, is an incredible study because they, in moving into their, yes, platinum lead interior install, but separately 1.65 watts a foot consumption above air conditioning load. Their, their engineers, their lawyers insisted in six and a half watts in the lease. Their mechanical engineers designed and installed six and a half watts per square foot distribution. They're consuming 1.65 watts a foot. It shows on the bottom line. This is what's critical. You got to make money on the bottom line. So, replicable model. Replicable model. This is important. Let's read through this literally point by point. Okay. Identify opportunities. Using the Department of Energy's eQuest system, and actually if you talk to people who really know it wasn't really created by the Department of Energy, but they adopted it. They're the, really the pushers of the program. We created a template which allows us to measure the impacts of combinations of 67 different energy efficiency retrofit measures. Step back for a second. By <coughs> August of 2007, we had a fully laid out energy, uh, in theory, energy efficient or green program 
for the upgrade of the Empire State Building, one year after we took it over. We then had the Clinton Climate Initiative come in with Johnson Controls, Honeywell, and Siemens to critique the program which had been established for us by our owner rep who I hired, Jones Lang LaSalle. Honeywell gassed, didn't even know how to figure it out. Siemens and Johnson Controls made their presentations, which were then critiqued by the Rocky Mountain Institute. And then we had a charrette during which Johnson Controls made their presentation and was critiqued by Rocky Mountain Institute. And Siemens made their presentation and were critiqued by the Rocky Mountain Institute. What we developed was that we had to start looking far outside of the box in which everybody's lives had been up to that point to come up with new approaches. Instead of looking at individual systems, lighting, air, pumps, what we had to do was actually look at an integrated approach brought on by the Rocky Mountain Institute evaluating with this DOE eQuest system in order to come up with the best permutation to produce the best result with the shortest term payback. So what we did is, is we actually, through the Rocky Mountain Institute, we developed what we called this theoretical minimal, minimum energy usage. However, as you'll see on the cost curve that we put together, what we showed is we could reduce energy consumption by about 60 some odd percent, but the paybacks would be over an extraordinarily long period of time. My focus was five years, because my view was that if you can't make an economic payback in five years, that, that's about as much time as people are prepared to give the concept of energy efficiency. We really were focused on this, net present value. We did look at greenhouse gas savings. We did look to apply a, a reference of dollars per metric ton of carbon reduced. We did calculate it by every pot potential energy efficiency retrofit measure which we utilized, but it was all about net present value. In creating the package, we wanted to maximize the net present value. Notice how this term is used repeatedly. <laughs> Balance the net present value in carbon savings. Maximize the carbon savings for a zero net present value. Maximize the CO2 savings. That's the last piece, CO2 savings. I know if I'm saving energy, I'm going to reduce carbon cons you know, creation, carbon consumption, and carbon dioxide output. But bringing it all about money, and then the model, modeling things iteratively. You know, this is getting overwhelmed, my poor little Swiss Army laser pointer. Uh, we want to model things uh, iteratively, constantly going back to what is the best permutation, what's the best combination to get the best result. So what we did is we established a red light, green light, yellow light program. We looked at the entire program that had been put together in, by, by, by August of 2007, and we said, you know what? We're never going to have any impact with regard to energy consumption for this project. This is a green light project. It can go ahead. We're not sure about this project. It's a yellow light project. Let's examine this further. We know that this project is not being done in an energy optimal fashion. It's a red light. We're going to redo that project. So what we did is, if you look at the comparison, we started out with the capital budget. They call it the 2008, but it's the one that was completed by August 2007 for energy-related projects. 525, $550 million being spent at the Empire State Building. Take out the observatory and the broadcast. You're down to about 475. Okay? Of the 475, $120 million of that expenditure is expenditure we had planned to make anyway, which is being impacted by the energy efficiency retrofit program. We're doing the same things differently. 
corridors, bathrooms, pumps, fans, whatever you like. We added $20 million of expenditure we had not planned to spend. But we saved $7 million. So that's where you get this net $13 million additional. Our savings at the energy costs in place when we signed our contract, $4.4 million a year. 13 additional, 4.4 saved. Okay? So the point is it's a 3.1 year pay, uh, payback. Our target was five, we ended up at 3.1. All right? You have $106 million by this measurement spent to create a, a guaranteed 38% savings in BTUs and watts. The Johnson Controls contract only guarantees 90%. So the result is we actually will be targeting over 40%. The key thing is that the incremental cost to the office building component was $13 million over $475 million. It's around a 3% additional cost when you're looking at a building-wide retrofit to incorporate a savings of approximately 40% in energy consumption. Here's what we like to call our, our cost curve. Anybody here familiar with the Vattenfall carbon cost curve, the McKinsey study? Anyone? One, two, that's it. Okay, well, the concept of that cost curve is that a significant amount of energy savings is a positive cost, not a negative cost. You make money, all right? This is our own version of the cost curve because this shows the, 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 the range of paybacks from this program. This would be incorporating that, 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 that absolute least expensive NPV max savings. This shows the absolute max carbon savings, okay? But what this shows is that if you go for the max point, you've got this negative $25 million cost over 15 years. That's obviously unacceptable. And by the way, every single thing that you're seeing is available on esbsustainability.com, including this presentation, okay? So you can take notes if you want to ask questions, but you don't have to write too much. Everything, our contract is on there. Every piece of data as we generate it is added to that website. So this is the point we chose. This is where we looked at cost, which ended up being that, that $20 million that I referred to, additional cost, $13 million net with the savings. But this is also where we end up with our much shorter term payback. And as you see, the, 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 the more you move out, this is very inexpensive right here to get these <coughs> savings. To move, however, on the carbon axis to maximum carbon reduction, this is super expensive, all right? That's how we arrived at, at, our, at, our, at our point. If you look at where we did our work and where we're doing our work today, chiller and controls comprise this component of the savings. But work within the tenant spaces comprise a much larger piece of the savings. You've got to work with the tenants. We can't dictate to our tenants because they'll go someplace else where they're not being told what they have to do. So what we're doing here is we're working with our tenants, certain things we can do no matter what. Tenant DCV we control, radiative barrier we control. Giving tenants energy management tools we control. Retrofitting the building windows we control. VAVs we control on the air handling units, pumps and, 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 and uh, I mean fans and, uh, and louver, uh, uh, louvers. But the tenant day lighting and, uh, and lighting uh, and, and plugs, 
you know, that's where we have to work with the tenants on their install. But what this means, by the way, is all of these other issues we control as the landlord. So that you understand, going through some of the components uh, will come up in a, in, in, in a little bit in the slide. In the tenant spaces, the argument that we've been able to make successfully now to about 150,000 square feet worth of tenants is we have a suite of services that we can provide to you which are being packaged up and then they too will be replicable. Just so you know, we're trying to roll this out to our entire portfolio. The Empire State Building, we have hundreds of people who work there. We've got a very big building with a lot going on. We provide these services in-house. We're trying to figure out how to dumb it down and simplify it so we can bring it to our 400,000 and 800,000 and millions square foot buildings in New York. And we have properties out in the suburbs as well. The tenants, if we can control, one of the biggest things where you can control energy consumption is in temperature. If we can do a better job controlling temperature, the number one complaint from tenants, too hot, too cold. How many people are too warm in this room right now? You know, how many people are too cold? You know, so could be, but, but the long story short, number one complaint, we survey our tenants every year, number one complaint, too hot, too cold. If you better control the temperature, you're not only reducing energy consumption, you're getting happier tenants. Air quality. If we're more efficient in how we condition our air, we actually end up producing better quality air. Lighting. Our tenant installs have not only motion detectors to activate lights, even our hallways are dark unless someone's walking in them and the lights go on, common area hallways in the building, but they're also photosensitized <coughs> to light intensity. All right. How many times do you sit there in your office, or will you sit there in your office, with all the lights on and it's the middle of the day, broad daylight? That is a tremendous waste. So it's not only is somebody there, but is it bright enough that you don't need the lights from overhead? <clears throat> and this goes into our design guidelines for the building. And it points out to the tenants, Make these simple steps and you'll have a positive return on your investment in your space. Uh, just so we're clear, I'm now into what the Johnson Controls and Jones Lang people usually present in this slideshow, so bear with me, okay? This is an actual tenant space fit up, utilizing the principles which we are working into our tenant spaces. This happens to be Skanska's build out, full floor, 32nd floor of the Empire State Building. When they talk about lead premium, all right, this is their total cost to their build out above a standard office install. They group it as lead. Again, I'm telling you, they do things in their build out which are not part of lead, which are energy efficiency related. So this is their slide. The additional costs for building their space in an energy efficient fashion, $210,000. The energy savings created over 15 years at a discounted rate, just about $600,000. They got a $22,000 NYSERDA grant for reducing their energy load. Their positive value for their experience 405,000 bucks, all right? So the concept is being able to show the tenants from an economic perspective that energy conservation is a smart thing to do. <clears throat> this slide, quite frankly, just says the same thing. <laughs> and I'm gonna let you read it online because it's too complicated for me. Um, but the point that I want to make on this slide is we have eight different tools that we're using. I'm sorry if you guys on the right here that you can't read what's on the bottom line. I'll just say that the baseline right here, then you've got the balancing of the controls of, of, of the, the, the conditioning systems. 
tenant daylighting and plugs, using VAVs in the air handling units, retrofitting the chiller plant, retrofitting the building windows, which you'll see in a second, putting tenant energy management systems. We have a, we have a, a, a smart dashboard for tenants. It shows them how they're using their, their, their energy, how they're consuming energy, okay? And not only does it show them how they're consuming energy, it shows them how they match up against other tenants on a per square foot basis in the building. And it allows them to ask questions, how can I reduce my energy consumption? And it gives them answers. The radiative barrier, <clears throat> and then, uh, then, then tenant controls, shows you the energy reduction from the baseline. The interesting point here is there's no silver bullet. It's an integrated approach of taking a number of different items together to achieve a result. Windows. It's really important. We're going to talk about two things. When we started out with our program, we started out as everybody else does. Let's put in the most efficient lights. Let's put in the most efficient cooling system. We know what our cooling load is because we know how many square feet we have and we know how many, square, how many tons per, per thousand square feet tenants typically require. What the Rocky Mountain Institute did was to say, wait a second, you don't know anything. You know that you want to have a lit, healthy environment for your tenants at a reasonably consistent temperature, okay? Before you start attacking anything else, what are some of the ways to get there? We already had duopane, they used to be called thermopane, but I'm now told that we have to call them duopane, windows in the Empire State Building. Single pane, R1, Thermopane or duopane R2, the most effective you can get, you know, like you know, the no energy transfer whatsoever, I think is an R20. One of the brilliant ideas, RMI, one of the things that RMI did is they came in with all these ideas, but they didn't come up with costs associated to any of them, and payback. So they said, well, the obvious thing you got to do is you got to put in triple glazed windows with krypton argon gas and inserts and a mylar sheet in the middle. Great. $2,200 to $2,500 a window, wow. okay? We're taking all our dual pane windows. We're taking them out. We're establishing a microprocessing facility in the building. They go in one end of this piece of equipment, which is being loaded into the building through windows on the fifth floor. They get separated. They get cleaned. A spacer is inserted. A mylar sheet is inserted. They are resealed with krypton argon gas in them, and then they are reinstalled in the building. They never leave the building. It takes it to an R8 window. Right? So that's just taking an existing piece of equipment. It's not transporting it anywhere. Now, obviously, smaller buildings, you might have to have a plant set up in a building in order to bring windows a block or two. And if you have buildings like the Chrysler building, not to name buildings, uh, another fine Tishman Spire product, uh, which, has no, which has no duo pane or thermo pane windows in it, you know, they could spend the money to install a better window. But if you have duo pane, you can do this. This is a major factor. Why? Because this along with a radiative barrier. If you go into an office building in New York, there's typically no radiative barrier whatsoever between the radiator and the exterior of the wall. You pull that radiator enclosure off, you're going to see a radiator and you're going to see a masonry wall on the other side. We're heating the outsides of our buildings. We're heating New York. We're literally heating the city. Similarly, we're allowing heat in. So what RMI said is, hit the windows, hit the radiative barrier, you have now created the environment in which you're looking to create your temperature without outside factors hitting you. Tenant daylighting, lighting and plugs. Reduce lighting power intensity. You walk into an office, it's endless two by four and two by two trays dropped in. Yeah. Why? How much lighting do you really need? How many people talk about after having been in an office for 9, 10, 12 hours? You're like, oh, I got such a headache. 
You don't have a headache because you're overworked. You may have a headache because you got a sinus problem or something, but you probably have a headache because it's too damn bright in your office. The correct amount of lighting is critical. New York City's actually begun to address this in their Greater Greener Building Code twisting down the amount of light you're allowed to put in. But then you take the next factor, if you're near windows, you have daylighting. Most older buildings have a much greater window to floor area ratio. Older buildings are actually empowered better than modern glass box buildings because they don't have to penetrate deep into the space with natural daylighting. You don't have areas which basically would be dark, right? So this is just a basic space in the Empire State Building. Why is the floor area to window ratio so much better in older buildings? Because they didn't have air conditioning. You needed to get air into the space. So you tone down the lighting. What does that do? It not only saves energy, it doesn't produce as much heat. You have less cooling. The chillers, we are using variable frequency drives on all of our chillers. We're reconditioning the chillers. We are saving money. We thought we had to replace the chillers in the building. Instead, we're reconditioning the chillers and the, and the cooling towers instead of replacing them. We're not putting in cogeneration because we don't need it. We have plenty of electricity coming into the building, as it turns out. Using these controls, why? The Empire State Building will have one of the largest wireless networks in the world and the largest wireless network installed for the purpose of energy control in the world. What does that mean? It means every radiator trap, every louver, every air handling fan, every pump, every cooling tower fan, is all linked to a building management system monitored in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, as part of the Johnson Controls contract. Commissioning is so important. When you build a building, you got to go in and you got to make sure it works right. But the problem is that within about 18 or 24 months, the building's out of whack. Tenant installations come in, come out, people move equipment around. You end up too hot, too cold. By controlling pumps and fans throughout the system and louvers, you're directing the cooling where it's needed, controlling the radiators digitally rather than just with, you know, with your, your typical screw, even if that typical screw has a thermostat attached to it. What does that mean? You're only using as much energy as you need when you need it. What does that mean? At sunrise, the person on the west side of the building isn't going to be frying. At sunset, or on, on the west side of the building, excuse me, isn't going to be freezing. And at sunset, the building on the east side, the person on the east side of the building isn't going to be freezing, or vice versa, frying and, and having normal temperature. But it means we're being much more conservative. We're improving the quality of the space. These air handling units, as I said, we're, we're, we're changing this all to VAV and VFD, toning down the amount of electricity we need because we're not running constant speeds in all locations. The DDC, the largest wireless network ever installed, this, none of this, not one thing we are using is new technology. Every single thing is off the shelf from major manufacturers, okay? Proven stuff. We're just combining it in a way that hasn't been used before. We're bringing in more outside air. Very easy to do. Again, the Empire State Building was built in the 1930s, okay? <laughs> if we can do this, it can be done in any building. Really, truly. But when you bring in the outside air, this is where in San Francisco they realize why do buildings in San Francisco have air conditioning? Because they can't bring in outside air. It hardly ever gets above 72, 73 degrees in San Francisco. Yet they use air conditioning when it's 60 degrees outside. 
because all the hair, the hot air builds up inside. A big component of this program is its adaptability. It will have a different set of energy efficiency measures that make sense based on building type, building systems, and geography. The tenant energy management system, as I told you, this is kind of what the dashboard will look like. It's either mounted on the wall, which it is right now in one of our pre-builds, or it can be brought up on somebody's on somebody's computer screen, giving feedback to tenants. Um, so anyhow, as we finish up here, full exploration of uh, all energy efficiency measures can be time consuming and resource intensive, but it doesn't take 14 months, 16 months to do it at every building. This process is now being done at other buildings in New York where the preliminary work has been done and contracts are about to be signed and they'll be You'll know them because as we, as each building does it, it's going to say same process is done at the Empire State Building, then the next building is going to be same process is done at the Empire State Building, this other building. We're not looking to create a new association, but we are looking to say that, that this, this system, which now takes about six months to do, uh, is, 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 is uh, does take time, but it gets, you can get it right. You realize the maximum impact requires all the building stakeholders, including tenants. Some measures are not economically viable. Now, what this does do, however, is this provides a tool, and we're working with the Real Estate Roundtable in Washington, to be able to go to the US government and make the comment that energy efficiency delivers three to five times the benefits in watts that alternative energy does for the same dollar. All right? So, before we start building out the alternative energy system and the smart grid and everything, let's figure out how much energy we really need to consume. And if you can actually say across the United States you're going to be saving 25 to 30 percent less than we're doing at the Empire State Building, just based on economics, doesn't that mean that you can reduce the total grid that's required? You can reduce the total energy that's required. So on a panel, with the sustainability people, uh, the chief sustainability people of Hewlett Packard, Texas Instruments, Walmart, uh, for the Rocky Mountain Institute annual uh, meeting. And the guy at Texas Instruments commented about how he gets things in the suggestion box. We have this big plant, it's in Texas, why don't we have solar on the roof? And he responds, because until alternative energy generation equals my cost of energy conservation benefit, I'm not going to do it. Right. So this is a huge opportunity for us. Uh, financing. There's a lot of activity taking place on financing. Take a look at the PACE financing process. The long, long story short is, I think the financing is a false marker. If you're going to redo your building, it doesn't cost anything extra really to incorporate energy efficiency. If your building is bust anyway because it's over leveraged, you got a problem. However, there are things that are being approached. Everyone familiar how the business improvement districts provide their budgets? Special assessments. Special assessments, exactly. What is unique about them? What's unique about them is they prime the mortgage. Complying with law is a, is a payment which is required, uh, which is allowed, excuse me, under every mortgage document. So the landlord is required to pay, <coughs> to pay more, what does it do? It, the, the flow of revenue goes to support bonds and finance improvements. Similarly, there's a move out there called PACE, and everyone can take a look at the, the, the you know, look, Google that. But the bottom line is, it has to do with collecting additional real estate taxes to pay for financing for energy efficiency. And what that does is even a building that's over levered would then be able to get access to funds because you're priming the mortgage. You're getting ahead of the lender. Lenders do not like this. <clears throat> Many buildings are subscale for large ESCO programs. This is complicated. Therefore, one of the things we did with New York City's Greater Greener Building Code is took them away from requiring all buildings to do everything because it won't work in smaller buildings unless and until we come up with a much more constrained and reduced 
menu of things that, w w that one would get be involved with. Because th th it, there's, there's, there's a component here the other, of, of, of people power. The other thing, however, is what it says is the way you want to make impact is go for the largest energy bills out there. Devote the resources to them because that's where you're going to get your 40% savings. And that's where, you know, that's where you're going to be able to find your biggest impacts in the shortest period of time. Resource limitations. We need training. If you're a LEED certified architect, you don't know how to do what we did. If you're a LEED certified engineer, you don't know how to do what we did. If you know, the, the, you've got lots of acronyms at the end of your names, you still don't know, to do, you know how to do what we did. You need, it needs training. And therefore, we've got to use our limited resources on the biggest nuts when possible. Practical next steps. Out of this list, I'd say the things that are most important, an integral, an integrated whole building retrofit approach. Okay? If you have an opportunity to be a decision maker or an influencer and someone is looking at an energy efficiency retrofit and they say, yeah, let's focus on lights first, say no. They say, well, let's focus on the cooling system first, say no. The first thing you gotta do is Take a whole building retrofit approach. Look at the entire piece. We never could have done what we did at the Empire State Building if we didn't start with windows and insulation. Just like, an, just like a house. And then we built on that. The next thing is engage the tenants, employees and building occupants. We've been able to do this been able to say to them, remember, this is a no compromise approach. We don't say to them, come to the Empire State Building, we'll save you money, it'll be a little darker, be a little hotter in the summer, be a little colder in the winter, we only have half as many elevators operating as everybody else, and that's just gonna be, yeah, thanks, we'll see you later. This is a no compromise approach. The sixth point, create concrete successes at the building and, 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 and pre-built, meaning tenant level. This is critical. Why? Because we need the momentum here. We need to be able to demonstrate that the real estate industry can be a major component in solving things like energy consumption, national security, you know? This is what we're talking about. If we can drop nationwide energy consumption in the built environment by 20 to 25 percent, and the consumption of energy in the United States by the built environment approaches 50%, you're talking about a 10 to 12 and a half percent energy savings for the United States. Okay? That's big. That's really big. And when you consider the factors on transportation that are taking place, reducing energy consumption in cars by increasing the corporate average fuel economy standards, and other areas, Basically, it's a race to the bottom. That's what we need to get to. These two folks, Dana Schneider and Paul Rohde, are the most informed people working together in the United States on this. And every single project which is being looked at now, which includes a, a major headquarters in New York City, actually two major headquarters in New York City, but one is actually underway, a very large building that was bought in 2009, which will remain nameless, but where this is underway and will be announced shortly. Work being done at hospitals, work being done at Lincoln Center, work being done with New York City. We've been out in San Francisco. The city of Philadelphia has come up. Understand what's happening here. This is pissing a lot of people off. It's actually not pissing them off. It's scaring them because it's new and it's disruptive. And it flies in the face of what I brought up initially. Green today is not energy efficient. And we gotta change it so that it is. And until then, we separate the two. So uh, that's the end of the, pr the presentation.